Psalm 139. For the choir director, a psalm of David. O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You understand my thought from afar. You scrutinize my path and my lying down and are intimately acquainted with all my ways. Even before there is a word on my tongue, behold, O Lord, you know it all. You have enclosed me behind and before and laid your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is too high. I cannot attain to it. Where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. If I take the wings of the dawn, if I dwell in the remotest part of the sea, even there your hand will lead me. And your right hand will lay hold of me. If I say, surely the darkness will overwhelm me and the light around me will be night. Even the darkness is not dark to you and the night is as bright as the day. Darkness and light are alike to you. For you formed my inward parts. You wove me in my mother's womb. I will give thanks to you, Lord, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works, and my soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the depths of the earth. Your eyes have seen my unformed substance, and in your book were written all the days that were ordained for me, when as yet there was not one of them. How precious also are your thoughts to me, O God! How vast is the sum of them! If I should count them, they would outnumber the sand. When I wake, I am still with you. Oh, that you would slay the wicked, O God! Depart from me, therefore, men of bloodshed, for they speak wickedly against you, and your enemies take your name in vain. Do I not hate those who hate you, O Lord, and do I not loathe those who rise up against you? I hate them with the utmost hatred. They have become my enemies. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxious thoughts and see if there be any hurtful way in me and lead me in the everlasting way. Let's pray. Lord God, you are the God who sees. You see it all. You know it all. There is nothing that's outside of your purview, outside of your authority, outside of your sight. Lord, you are in control, and we're grateful for that because we are weak. We are unable to control matters. And we wouldn't do it properly if we could. Lord, thank you that your hand is upon me and upon this world. Lord, we pray that your word would be heard today and that we would be changed by it and that our hearts and minds and our hands and feet would be used to glorify you and to further your kingdom. And we pray it all in Jesus' name.
Amen. Psalm 139 is one of the best known and most loved in the Psalter. It's often recognized for being rich in theology, namely with references to selected attributes of God. But it is so much more. Psalm 139 is categorized as a wisdom psalm. We see these attributes through the eyes of David, the sweet psalmist of Israel. 2 Samuel 23. We see the Lord in his awe-inspiring magnificence, and yet simultaneously in a very intimate light. The heading of Psalm 139 says, For the choir director, a psalm of David. So we know that it was written by David and intended to be sung. That said, it is also a beautiful, God-exalting poet. Poem as well. David addresses God directly throughout this psalm. His tone is generally reverent, and yet very personal. In Psalm 139, David makes four remarkable observations about God. Observation number one in verses one through six, our God is omniscient, and he knows everything about each one of us. Observation number two, our God is omnipresent, and he is with each and every one of us, wherever we go, verses 7 through 12. Observation number 3, verses 13 through 18. Our God is omnipotent, and he sovereignly created each one of us. Observation number 4, verses 19 through 24. Our God is holy, and he is able to lead us to righteousness. So let's take a look, closer look at our text. We'll start with observation number one. Our God is omniscient and he knows everything about each one of us. Verse one reads, O Lord, you have searched me and known me. David begins by addressing God as Lord by his covenant name, Yahweh asserting that God has examined him and knows him. This is true for all of us. What a marvelous thought that is. David goes on to acknowledge that God knows everything about him. In the most intimate detail, he expresses this through the use of various diverse and extreme comparisons. It's as if David is saying that God's knowledge of him is from A to Z and everything in between. God knows it all in perfect detail. What we do, what we think, where we go, even our habits and idiosyncrasies. Verse 2 says, You know when I sit down and when I rise up, You understand my thought from afar. You scrutinize my path and my lying down and are intimately acquainted with all my ways. And since God knows our thoughts, he knows what we're going to say before we say it. Verse 4. Even before there is a word on my tongue, behold, O Lord, you know it all. God even knows what we don't say. We would be wise to listen to the Holy Spirit when he convicts us to still our tongues. The book of James tells us that we can easily get in trouble with our speech. James chapter 3, verse 1 reads, Let not many of you become teachers, my brethren, knowing that as such we will incur stricter judgment. For we all stumble in many ways. If anyone does not stumble 
in what he says he is a perfect man, able to bridle the whole body as well. Now, if we put the bits into the horse's mouths so that they will obey us, we direct their entire body as well. Look at the ships also. Though they are so great and are driven by strong winds, they are still directed by a very small rudder, wherever the inclination of the pilot desires. So also is the small part, the tongue is a small part of the body, and yet it boasts of great things. See how great a forest is set aflame by such a small fire. And the tongue is a fire, the very world of iniquity. The tongue is set among our members as that which defiles the entire body and sets on fire the course of our life and is set on fire by hell. For every species of beasts and birds and reptiles and creatures of the sea is tamed and has been tamed by the human race, but no one can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil and full of deadly poison. With it we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse men who have been made in the likeness of God. Genesis 1, 26 and 27. From the same mouth come both blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not to be this way. Does a fountain send out from the same opening both fresh and bitter water? Can a fig tree, my brethren, produce olives or a vine produce figs? Nor can salt water produce fresh. Back in Psalm 139, verse 5, David recognizes that God is protecting him on all sides and personally blessing him. Verse 5 reads, You have enclosed me behind and before and laid your hand upon me. Other Psalms reinforce this idea that God surrounds his people with protection and blessing. Psalm 125, 2 says, As the mountains surround Jerusalem, so the Lord surrounds his people from this time forth and forever. Psalm 32, 10 says, Many are the sorrows of the wicked, but he who trusts in the Lord, loving kindness shall surround him. David closes this section of 139 with verse 6. It says, Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is too high. I cannot attain to it. This draws our minds to Isaiah 55, verse 8 and 9. God speaking, saying, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. This leads us to our second observation. Our God is omnipresent, and he is with each one of us wherever we go. Verse 7 reads, Where can I go from your spirit, or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, behold, you are there. If I take the wings of the dawn, if I dwell in the remotest part of the sea, even there your hand will lead me, and your right hand will lay hold of me. David begins this section with some rhetorical questions and wide-ranging conditional declarations that support the fact that God is spirit in essence and he is present everywhere at all times. Wherever you might go, the spirit of God is there with you. God transcends all mortal material boundaries and concerns. 
He is not deterred by the light nor the absence of light. He is not overcome by dark forces of evil. God is sovereign and he is in authoritative control in every realm. God is large and in charge in every domain. Verse 11 says, If I say, surely the darkness will overwhelm me, and the light around me will be night, even the darkness is not dark to you. And the night is as bright as the day. Darkness and light are alike to you. Evil spirits are no match for our God. They fear him. Matthew, tw- Matthew chapter 8, verse 28 reads, When he, Jesus, came to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, where he demonstrated his power over the wind and the waves, into the country of the Gadarenes, two men who were demon-possessed met him as they were coming out of the tombs. They were so extremely violent that no one could pass by the way. And they cried out, saying, What business do we have with each other, Son of God? Have you come here to torment us before the time? Now there was a herd of many swine feeding at a distance from them. The demons began to entreat him, saying, If you are going to cast us out, send us into the herd of swine. And he said to them, Go. And they came out and went into the swine. And the whole herd rushed down the steep bank into the sea and perished in the waters. Satan himself, the so-called prince of darkness, is no match for God. God is always with you. Jesus affirms it in the Great Commission. Matthew 28, 18 reads, And Jesus came up and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Hebrews 13, 5 says, I will never leave you, nor will I ever forsake you. God is with us. This brings us to our third observation. Our God is omnipotent, and he sovereignly created each one of us In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, Genesis 1-1. God created everything from nothing. Here in verse 13 of Psalm 139, David praises God for creating him. He says, For you formed me, you formed my inward parts, you wove me in my mother's womb. I will give thanks to you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works, and my soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the depths of the earth where no one sees. Your eyes have seen my unformed substance. And God knows what your lifespan will be and all of the minutest details of your life because he ordained it. Verse 16, the second half of verse 16 reads, And in your book were all written the days that were ordained for me, when as yet there was not one of them. My mother's birthday was just a couple of weeks ago. She would have been a 100 years old where she's still alive. Throughout my childhood, my mother would always say, I'm going to live to be 105. 
I'm sure I heard that at least 105 times. But I always wondered, how did she know? Do you just decide how long you're going to live? Well, it turns out that it was just a prediction. And she was ultimately wrong. Only God knows these things. And it is recorded in his book. Every detail is recorded in advance in God's book. It's not a physical book. It's in the cloud. That's a joke. By the way, every year on my mother's birthday, I would ask her, Mom, how old are you again? And every single year she would answer, I'm 36. And every year I would reply, oh yeah, that's right. Years later, I did the math. And I discovered that she was actually 38 years old when I was born. Yeah, I was that kid. Back to verse 17 of our text. How precious also are your thoughts to me, O God. How vast is the sum of them. If I should count them, they would outnumber the sand. When I awake, I am still with you. Psalm 40, verse 5 says, Many, O Lord my God, are the wonders which you have done. And your thoughts toward us, there is none to compare with you. If I would declare and speak of them, they would be too numerous to count. I also want to call your attention to the end of verse 18 in Psalm 139. It says, When I awake, I am still with you. It's not unusual to see Bible references to falling asleep, to infer death. Some commentators have suggested that the phrase, when I awake, may actually be a reference to life after death. If you are a born-again Christian, when you awake, you will indeed still be in the presence of the Lord. He is with you always. Jesus said to the repentant thief on the cross, Truly, truly, I say to you today, you shall be with me in paradise. This brings us to our fourth and final observation. That is that our God is holy and he is able to lead us to righteousness. This section, verses 19 through 24, makes for a sudden jarring transition. Because of David's extreme change in attitude, it would best be described as imprecatory, which typically indicates that the psalmist is calling for God to act in a wrathful or cursing manner. Verse 19 reads, Oh, that you would slay the wicked, O God. Depart from me, therefore, men of bloodshed. For they speak against you wickedly, and your enemies take your name in vain. Do I not hate those who hate you, O Lord? And do I not loathe those who rise up against you? I hate them with the utmost hatred. They have become my enemies. Then, just as suddenly as the imprecatory content began, David's attitude shifts again. He suddenly humbles and quiets himself before the Lord asking that God would show him his sin. It is as if God convicted David in that moment and made him aware of his own sin, perhaps even before the words were on his tongue. Verse 23 says, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me 
and know my anxious thoughts and see if there be any hurtful way in me and lead me in the everlasting way. And we don't know the occasion that may have led to Psalm 139. So we don't really know when David was inspired by the Holy Spirit to write it. That said, I think it's possible that David was reflecting on a story he recounted in 1 Chronicles 28. In this passage, David remarks that God called him a man of bloodshed, which David called God's enemies in Psalm 139. 1 Chronicles 28, 2 and following reads. Then David rose to his feet and said, Listen to me, my brethren and my people. I had intended to build a permanent home for the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord and for the footstool of our God. So I had made preparations to build it. But God said to me, You shall not build a house for my name, because you are a man of war and have shed blood. Yet the Lord, the God of Israel, chose me from all the house of my father to be king over Israel forever. For he has chosen Judah to be a leader, and in the house of Judah, my father's house, and among the sons of my father he took pleasure in me to make me king over all Israel. Of all my sons, for the Lord has given me many sons, he has chosen my son Solomon to sit on the throne of the kingdom of the Lord over Israel. He said to me, Your son Solomon is the one who shall build my house and my courts for I have chosen him to be a son to me, and I will be a father to him. I will establish his kingdom forever if he resolutely performs my commandments and my ordinances as is done now. This is a reference to 2 Samuel 7, verse 8 and following, which you should read at some point in the near future. It is remarkable how easily we can see the sin in others, but somehow at times forget about or overlook our own sin. That is, until the Holy Spirit convicts us. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said, Do not judge so that you will not be judged. For in the way you judge, you will be judged. And by your standard of measure, it will be measured to you. Why do you look at the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Or how do you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye, and behold, the log is in your own eye? You hypocrite. First, take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. Still, we should not conclude that David was wrong in Psalm 139 for condemning and considering the enemies of the Lord to be his own enemies, nor for calling on God to pour out his divine wrath. This is truly righteous indignation. In fact, David's request seems to agree with what Paul says in Romans 12, verse 19. Never take your own revenge, beloved, but leave room for the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine, and I will repay, says the Lord. But if your enemy is hungry, feed him. And if he is thirsty, give him a drink. For in so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. God's people are also commanded to love their enemies, Jesus said in Matthew 5. You've heard it said, 
you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he causes the sun to rise on the evil and the good, and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. Please note that Revelation 2 identifies Jesus as the one who searches our hearts and knows our deeds. Selected verses from Revelation 2 read, starting in 18. And to the angel of the church in Thyatira write, The Son of God, who has eyes like a flame of fire, and his feet are like burnished bronze, says this, I know your deeds. I am he who searches the minds and the hearts, and I will give to each one of you according to your deeds. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. I find it interesting that David has created a set of bookends in this psalm. In verse 1, he declares that God has searched him and knows him. And then in verse 23, he asks God to search him again. On the surface, the second search seems entirely unnecessary, especially given that God already knows everything. So the request for the second search must be for David's benefit. David is submitting to God's authority, seeking to please God by repenting of his sin and conforming to God's will. Verse 23 reads, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxious thoughts and see if there be any hurtful way in me and lead me in the everlasting way. You may ask, what is the everlasting way? Hebrews 10, verse 19 says, Therefore, brethren, since we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he inaugurated for us through the veil that is his flesh. The everlasting way is eternal life in Christ. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. And let us consider God's love for us in light of how perfectly he knows us. He knows the good, the bad, and the ugly. He knows that we are not deserving of his love without Christ. Romans 5.8 says, But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his Son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only this, but we will also exult in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. Let's close in prayer. Lord God, I pray that your word would land both gently and with appropriate force, Lord, on the hearts 
of those who need to hear it. We all need to hear it, Lord, but there are those among us who are not saved. I pray, Lord, that this would be the beginning of your spirit tugging on their heartstrings. Move their minds and their hearts, Lord, and cause them to be added to your kingdom. We pray all these things in the name of Jesus, our Lord. Amen.